Well, hi everybody. I'm John Rithlin, and this is a retro review of NWA WCW Clash of the Champions 10 Texas Shootout. Famous for a few reasons. One, the build for Sting and Flair, a pretty good tag title match, and a huge bump from Cactus Jack, at least huge for that time, though he would take much, 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 much scarier bumps by the end of the decade. Sweet Christ, how is he still walking? The show was also during the Jim Hurd era, so it was a big old mess. And even though the clashes improved under Ric Flair's booking, Ric Flair just like, you know, I think Rick, I think it was actually around the time that Ric Flair decided to uh, quit being the booker because Jim Hurd was being a goddamn jackass. Wanting to chase Flair out of the company. Wanting to cut his hair and call him Spartacus. Great idea. So anyway, how was the show? Again, a mess. Opening video package, it's like a rail shooter, various stock images of wrestlers getting taken out, and then we get right to Jim Cornette and Jim Ross on commentary. We get Tuxedo Terry Funk as he names himself doing the interviews, well, in the ring, and kind of the host, and then we get Gordon Soley doing the backstage interviews. So pretty good quartet of talent right there. Uh, Terry Funk had been retired a few months before after losing an I Quit match to Ric Flair at the previous Clash in November of 89. Road Warriors promo, hyping up the tag match we're going to have later. Dr. Death uh, putting people in an ambulance and trying to save him, taking the Dr. Uh, gimmick literally. And then we get Dr. Death versus Simone Savage with the Big Kahuna, a.k.a. Oliver Humperdinck. Not a bad match, big man fight. Woman was there at ringside. Woman would be uh, integrated into the company a lot more. She was the wife of Kevin Sullivan at the time, would later become the wife of Chris Benoit. Nancy Benoit, by the way, in case you don't know. I mean, she would also have a stint in ECW and actually would, you know, be used pretty well in both companies. I mean, all things considered. And a backslide pins uh, Simone Savage 1, 2, 3. So not a bad match. Wrestle War Wild Thing had cheesy rap. Good God, the 1990s, early 90s uh, wrestling was so goddamn cheesy. Four horsemen are out there. It's Sting. Flair, Ole, and Arn. You're thinking, Sting and the Horsemen, what's going on? Well, a few months ago, I believe it was at, the, I believe it was at Starcade, if I recall correctly. Um, it had this big old schmoz, and you had, because like, they'd had this, but, this building friendship between Sting and Flair, because Sting had stayed Flair previously, and they'd kind of built this whole thing, and Flair had been uh, a babyface since uh, coming back to face Terry Funk, uh, at Great American Bash 89, so they had that going, and everybody's out there, and Sting had signed a contract to face Ric Flair for the title, well, they didn't like that, and Ole said, Sting, you're not going to be a horseman anymore, when you signed that contract, you signed your death warrant, and they said, you got till the end of the show, or we're going to beat you up, then they proceed to beat him up, so they're going to beat him up again, they're going to keep beating him up until he, uh, relinquishes that title shot, but of course, this is all to build Sting and Flair, which unfortunately would have to be dramatically changed at the end of the show. Like, and this was just a couple weeks. Of, I think it was like 19 days before the um, before the pay per view would happen. And so, unfortunately, because of the injury Sting would suffer, they would have to do a switch. So uh, we then get the Mod Squad, Mac and Jim Jeffers, Jobber Team. I believe they had to stint in the AWA and in Kansas City and a few other territories. Not really all that great of a team. I wasn't really that impressed with them. They took on uh, Brian Pillman and the Z-Man. Went too long. It, this should have been Pillman and Z-Man waiting like five minutes. I think it went, um, if it didn't go, if it didn't go more than, you know, like seven minutes, it felt like it actually went about 14. I don't think it went that long. But anyway, uh, second rope splash from Tom Zank, one, two, three. It would end better than the one he tried to do on Brian Lee at the no November 90 clash where he just did a crossbody in the midair because uh, Brian Lee missed the spot because the man threw him too far. It was hilarious. So anyway, now we're rolling right along. Mill Mascaros versus Cactus Jack. This was only famous for Cactus Jack taking that bump onto the concrete and it shook the freaking floor. You could feel it shake the floor and still wouldn't be probably even the scariest bump he would take that year. So, you know, Mascaros ends up uh, paying him, and then Cactus Jack is kind of like, you know, stumbling around, and he gets in a fight with one of the uh, band guys, there was a live band there, and one of the band members, I guess, was a former wrestler, if I, or if not former wrestler, but current wrestler, and they just got in a brawl and everything, it was all around to build Cactus Jack and stuff like that, pretty good stuff. Um, this is pretty enjoyable, only for the fact that they, that Cactus took the bump and it was what it was. Well, it wasn't enjoyable was Norman the Lunatic having a promo. Uh, he would later become Bastion Booger, by the way. He went to the zoo, and he was looking around at animals, and then he would face off against Kevin Sullivan in a Falls Count Anywhere match. This match was shit, absolute dog shit. They would brawl to the back. 
they would uh, go into the women's bathroom, but the camera wouldn't, and then uh, Norman would come out a little bit later, like, you know, a few seconds later, and he would win and be ho holding a toilet seat. So he pinned him on a toilet, I guess. I don't fucking know. Um, Kevin Sullivan matches were never all that good, and let's be honest, Mike Shaw, I believe, I believe that's who played Norman the Lunatic, I think that was his name, he was in Calgary, you know, as as a big man wrestler, then he would be in WWE, and it just it just never really worked with him, which is a shame. And it wasn't even a bad worker; it's just this gimmick. Norman the Lunatic was just stupid. Uh, but anyway, we then get a Terry Funk interview with Lex Luger, who was the current U.S. champion at the time, would um, had held the championship since I believe um, end of May of '89, and would hold it until uh, October of 1990. So he would hold it for 15 months. Wait. No, he would hold it longer than that, actually. I think he would hold it, um, I think he would hold it, like, you know, he would hold it for 523 days, so it was actually a bit longer than that. So it was a pretty damn long reign. Uh, he really couldn't cut a promo here, unfortunately, but he was a good cocky heel. The crowd's changing, we want Sting. They really wanted Sting. Holy crap, did they want Sting. Too bad they weren't going to get Sting, at least in any, any good capacity after this show for a few months. We then get the Skyscrapers, me, Mark Callis, who would later become The Undertaker, and Dan Spivey versus the Road Warriors. Road Warriors were on their way out of the company. They would be gone within a few months. And this wasn't very good. We also had uh, pre-match you know, pre uh, videos of the Road Warriors destroying cars in a junkyard. I don't know. Um, it was a power battle. Dan Spivey could not work at all. He really couldn't. He really was not any good. And I just don't understand why he was ever... I, do, I really don't understand looking at enough of his matches, just even in WCW, why he was ever really given a chance. And he also later became Waylon Mercy, which was the um, early incarnation of Bray Wyatt or the inspiration for Bray Wyatt. But he wasn't very good in the ring. And you can really tell. Like, I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't know what injuries he did or didn't have, but he just was not very good. Lano no selling, no hawk would sell his arm for a bit. And everybody, it, everything just broke down at the end. They hit the Doomsday device on Spivey and then... Mark hit a um, Mark hit animal with a chair. It was a big old brawl, big old schmoz. It was just a way to protect both teams, and it wasn't very good. What was good is Doom versus the Steiners, masks versus titles. It was very obvious it was Ron Simmons and Butch Reed under those masks. Especially obvious it was Butch Reed because he had much more of a name in wrestling. Ron Simmons was an up-and-comer. It was a good old power battle. These two always had really good matches, and... I, I like that this match went a bit long because it should have, because it was about, oh, are they going to mask or are, they, or are Doom going to get the tag titles? They would get the tag titles, I believe, a Capital Combat a little bit later, so in May, but they wouldn't get him here. Um, Rick Steiner's trying to remove the mask from Butch Reed, and he kind of gets the mask off and he can't see, and then suddenly he goes for a clothesline but just removes the mask, and oh, it's Butch Reed, and Butch is so shocked by the fact that he's unmasked, even though we all knew it was him. He got rolled up. One, two, three, and then the other one had to unmask and it's Ron Simmons, and then they would go on a pretty good run. Actually, I think after they won the titles in May, they would hold them until early '91, so they would hold them for quite a while. They were pretty good. Uh, they were pretty good uh, tag team champions. Uh, but it was what it was. It wasn't that bad. We then get a little bit of hype and everything. Video packages for the six man steel cage match, which was only Arn and Flair. It was supposed to be Sting, but then Sting got kicked out versus the Dragon Master. Great Muda and Buzz Sawyer. Buzz Sawyer being back in WCW was a little bit odd. It was a, but the steel cage match, the steel cage was barely higher than the goddamn ropes. It, I mean, it, I think it was like maybe a foot or two higher than the ropes. So it wasn't, it wasn't really all that tall of a steel cage. And the match wasn't that bad. There were some good exchanges and everything, but this is most famous for Sting coming down a few minutes uh, into it and trying to get into it with Ric Flair. And Doug Dillinger just trying to pull him off the uh, ropes or pull him off the cage. And at one point, he pulls him off, okay. And then he's trying to go back, and then he tries to go back out, and then he gets pulled down again, but unfortunately, Sting at this time tears his ACL. And he's limping around noticeably after the second, uh, you know, attempt at the run-in. And it's unfortunate because he would tear his, it wasn't just a tweak. No, he tore his ACL, and the, all the plans had to be ripped up. Oh, and uh, DDT pins the Dragon Master, and then Flair tries to attack Sting after he gets out of the cage. So that's pretty much it for right there. <laughs> they would have to switch everything around, and uh, uh, Luger, even though he was a heel and the U.S. champion, they would have to switch him and have him face Flair at Wrestle War. I will be reviewing Wrestle War. I will be reviewing Super Brawl 95 and Super Brawl 2000. I'm also going to be trying to review as many of these WCW pay-per-views from 90, 95, and 2000 as I can. 
since it's kind of nice to look back at this retro content and see how, how well have these matches aged. Some have not aged all that well. Anyway, do you agree, disagree with what I said? Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ritlin. I'll see you soon.